And then Samuel said unto Jesse, Are they all thy children? And he said, Oh, there remaineth the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. He said, Nobody sitting down. Prophet is mad now. You playing me? God sent me to anoint a king in your house, and you bring seven persons and leave one person out? And I believe that was a punishment because in those days, as David would later testify, he fought wild animals to protect his father's sheep. So I guess David was not just behind the house with the sheep because else he would have heard the noise that Samuel was in town and he would just run there. So David was, must have been far away, very far away. But Samuel said, no one is sitting down until you bring that boy. And you know, there was no GPS, there was no cell phones. Hey, yo, David, man, where you at? No. And then the herder, the shepherd, usually doesn't sit one place with his flocks. He's looking for greener pastures, right? So he might be at this location and he must be at another location. But long story short, David is brought in. And he sent and brought him in. He was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise now, Mr. Samuel, Mr. Know-all, and anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the oil, the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So many that Samuel didn't even stay for the after party. Just imagine if you come and someone is anointed as king in your house, at least you do is to kill a sheep and do a little barbecue for the priest. But Samuel is mad now and say, hey, I'm out of here. So from this passage of scripture, you see what God did. Jesse was tangled in trad tradition. The first is the first. The first is the first. The last is the last. The young sister, youngest sister will not get married until the oldest sister gets married. But from that day, a famous theme from the New Testament was unearthed right here. The first became what? The last and the last. That's a famous theme in the New Testament. Secondly, the, guy, the guys were punished. It's, prophet told him, you're going to stand. If you old man Samuel with your walker or old man Jesse with your walker, well, you got to put the walker and the cane aside and stand until that boy comes. And then the next thing will happen. Later on, as we all know, David goes on to defeat Goliath. Later on, we know that God gives David the strength to jump ahead of his brethren, which was grace. And then lastly, Saul was not a happy camper when he got to know that David was the next king in line. And Saul tried his utmost best to kill David. But what did God do? God protected him. So that's why I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't go, I couldn't start without this part of the, 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 the speech, uh, uh, Pastor, Amen. because if there is not a calling, if there's not a choosing by God, man, it's going to be difficult. I don't care how good of a leader you think you are. So we move to the next point. What type of leader do I want to be? I want to be a strong and courageous leader. I want to be strong spiritually, mentally, and physically. And we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse, one, uh, verse 2 and verse 7. I wouldn't, go, I wouldn't read that, but I just paraphrase now. 
Deuteronomy 31, 2 and 7. And Moses called the children of Israel. Yes, 2 and 7. They were about to move into the promised land. And Moses told them, I'm 102 years old now. I can barely move myself. But you, Joshua, you have to be strong and you have to be courageous. Because I think Moses too was speaking from experience. He dealt with their grandparents. He dealt with their great grandparents. So he said, I know the people you're dealing with. The nature is still in them. So you have to be strong and you have to be courageous in our personal lives. When we face difficulty, is it not always good to find somebody who is knowledgeable, who is strong, and who knows what they're doing, come, and we get that relief at work, and you're stuck on a certain process, you in the medical field, and you can't get something really working, and then the doctor comes in, say, I got it. You feel good. So same thing with a strong leader. If there's disarray and things are not working, but once the leader appears, oh, praise God, he's here. That's the nature of a strong leader. I had a couple of years ago, you know, I have maritime background, so there was this cruise ship, right, with over 2,000 passengers and crew members, and this vessel ran aground off the coast of Italy. And the interesting thing is that before the first responders could come, before the rescuers could come, and to save people, a lot of people died. The ship bow was destroyed and the oil was spilled was all over the place. And then when the first responder arrived on board, they said, where's the captain? Captain is nowhere to be found. They later found the captain at a nearby hotel relaxing. And the ethics of maritime, maritime law states that in the case of an emergency, the last person to disembark must be the captain. But this guy was the first person to jump off the ship. You know, and, and that just shows the type of leader that he was or that he is. He didn't have the courage. And sometimes courage is not the absence of fear. That's what we, that's what we, we always hear, right? Because sometimes I remember back in New York, we were upstairs and downstairs, had upstairs and downstairs house. And I'll be sleeping, man, having my but siesta, right? And then I hear a tap on me from wifey. What's up now? Oh, I'm hearing noise downstairs. Oh, Lord. Why did Jesus make me a leader of this house? And I have to get up and go down. Sometimes I'll be like, you know, why, why you just go in front and I just walk behind you and see what's up? But, you know, that's the nature. That's the leadership that God has placed into us. And that's what a good leader should be. You need to be courageous. And uh, my third point here that I would desire from God is the ability to understand humanity. To understand the human factor. Hmm. That's one thing we just don't pay much attention to. We all sit here, we are different, different personality types. I could say something to Pastor P right now, Pastor Philip, and we'll laugh and shake hands and walk away. I say the same thing to somebody else, they spiral into depression. So as a leader, it is good to know the makeup of your people, to know what makes them think. Some people get angry you know, there's a famous saying that you get on my last nerve and I'm angry. Some people get on the first nerve. They won't allow you to reach to the last nerve. And they're blowing up. So as a, as a leader, you always need to understand the humanity of humans, the human element. And we find that in Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 37, the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was spiritual. But why do you think he would see a parable like this? 
A man was beaten and laid by the road, and the priest comes and passes by and does nothing. The Levite comes and passes by and does nothing. And the ordinary guy comes and helps this man. But Jesus was telling us in as much, I believe in my personal opinion, in as much that we are concerned about the spiritual well-being of people, we should also be concerned about their physical well-being. So that's why Sunday when Sister Pressure came here and was talking, and I just smiled. I said, but I already made a draft of this thing, and look what Pastor's doing. Exactly. Catering to the well-being of the people. You know that already? Huh? No, no, no. What I'm saying is like it's tied in. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It really did tie in that Pastor's already doing something that I would have just suggested today because it's needed, you know? Understanding the psychology of your people is another thing. It is just as important. It's just to tie into what I just said. We look at 1 King 3, 16 to 28. Solomon, he had just asked God for wisdom. And then he gets his first case. And who is he judging amongst? When I read the first uh, verse of that scripture, they were harlots. I wonder why. I guess Solomon should have just said, okay, stop it right there. Call the priest. We have to sanctify you too. <laughs> but what did Solomon do? Psychology 101. The two women, I classify one as the bad woman because her baby died and she tried to claim her friend's baby and it go to the king. And the king said, okay, we cut the baby in half. And Miss Bad said, way to go, king. Cut that baby in half. And the mom said, no, don't do it. Don't. Even if the bad chick takes him, He's still alive. I'll see him some other day. Right there. Solomon didn't need the priest for that. He played on the emotions. He played on the psyche. And he was able to determine who the evil woman was. So those are tricks that a good leader should have. Let's move on. My fourth point. A good leader must make others better. If you are the leader and you the Mr. Know All and nobody under you knows anything, what type of leader are you? So make others better. Those that you lead, strive to make them better. And how do you do it? Pastor hit that point again. We talked about the workshop. You know, have conventions, have programs. Uh, Pastor Jakes has this program he runs called A Woman Thou Art Loose. I've heard so many powerful testimonies from that, from that program. And most often he doesn't preach. He'll bring other people. Expand the minds of your people. You know, don't let them hear from one source, because if you hear from one source, you are limited. Let them hear from other people, because when they grow, and the day that you are not around, guess what? They're going to keep it going. They're going to hold it down, because they are well exposed, and they know what to do. So that would be one of my desires as a leader is to make others better. We almost there. I hope I'm not boring you. And the fifth one, this one I call wow factor. I want to be a leader that is versatile in conflict resolution. Sometimes we treat conflicts in church like we treat death that is never going to happen. I'm sorry. 
both of them are inevitable. You can't run away from them. You know, conflict will arise. I've seen people get vexed in church when the music play and the pastor about to preach and somebody gets vexed in the church. You know what I'm saying? Things will happen. So what do we do? <laughs> what you say? Pastor say, hallelujah. Why you say that? <laughs> Whenever you say that, and you, the two of you, you got it down. When you say hallelujah, I say, look at these guys. Look at these guys. Look at this guy. But, yeah, we, we, we need to have a proactive approach to conflict. Don't do like that will never happen. We're going to fight, uh, uh, Pastor Philip. One of these days, we're going to fight. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may not, but that's the nature of our beings. So let us have a proactive approach. Expect it. And because we expect it, what do we do to mitigate that? What do we do? Let's start planning it. Because... My mom sat here, she said, oh, I sat on this bench and I've observed. Yeah, I've observed too, I've observed too since I've been here. Don't let someone get angry and stay away from church. That's not a solution. That's what people do. As soon as they get angry, they don't come. That's bad. That's dangerous for the church and that's dangerous for that person. Because the law, you know, we have a tendency as humans, if I offend you, you look for a third party to grieve to. You give your grievance to, right? And now you must have, you say too much that when the problem is finally fixed, then the guilt is in you. You say, oh, man, I said so much about this. You know what I'm saying? I said so much about this guy. Now, how will I go back and face him? So my thing is, let it be stopped the earliest so I would suggest to have a grievance box just like they have the suggestion box and the offering box. If I cross you, write a note. This guy did something to me and I need somebody to talk to us. Drop it in, put it in the box. And, and let there be a committee that will visit that box. And as soon, a grievance committee, as soon as to see that Request in there. Get to those, those two people right away. What happened? Oh, oh good. You should be glad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, even if it's wooding, there's, there should be someone's responsibility to go in there and see what's going on. Because the sooner that problem is fixed, the better it is. The better it is. Okay. Five, six ties into five. It's good to have and establish a suitable culture that leads to retention. Most of these, these last points now are just like free flow. I don't have no scriptures back in that. Culture is something that in the workplace you hear tossed around a lot. But it's very important. You find some companies, they're hiring today, they're hiring tomorrow, they're hiring day after tomorrow. Because why? They have a high turnover. People are running away. People don't like the culture. There's a book I'm reading by a lady called Emily Freeman. Unrelated, this is a computer book. But she said that people don't quit jobs. They quit managers. So people don't quit churches. They quit pastors. They quit leaders. They quit church members. They quit a bad culture within the church. So I'm so happy that, from my observation, Newbury has a very excellent culture. Newbury has a very excellent culture. But it's important because your culture leads to retention. 20, 
30 years from now, we will be the, 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 how you call it, the walker and the wheelchair brigades, and we'll be sitting in the back, and the little guy in uh, Pastor Bobby's hand, the little guy over there, they'll be running the show. But what if we don't retain Pastor Bobby? You think the kids will be here wherever he goes? He takes his kids with him. So let's try to develop a culture that leads to retention. That is why all these big denominations last hundreds, 200 years, because they've been passed from generation to generation to generation. So, in closing, we as humans, from the inception, from the day we are born, maybe we, we, we get cut some slacks when we are in the womb. You know, the mom gets all the responsibility. Say, oh, ah, be careful now, the baby, don't jump before you hurt the baby. All the attention is on the baby, right? And don't do this because you might do this to the baby. Okay, the mom takes the responsibility. Now the baby is born. Hey. Right from birth, the judgment starts. Is he ugly? Is he fine? Oh, yeah, he looks like his grandfather. Mm. That means he ain't too cute. But from... <laughs> it's just my saying, though. <laughs> But, but from that point, that innocent baby, we expect things from him. He has to meet milestones. When he's three months, is he balancing his head now? Is the neck strong enough? <laughs> okay, the neck is strong. And then from one obstacle to another, oh, is he sitting down? Is he crawling? Okay, yeah, he's crawling. Oh, what, what is he walking? Baby be like, dude, what's up? <laughs> but that's the pattern of our lives. You overcome one obstacle, and another one is standing there waiting for you. And that's why the, the, the circular artist said, Prasnika said, no die, no rest. Because if you, if you overcome one obstacle, there's another one. You go come another one, and there's another one, and there's another one. So our entire life, we're knocking down obstacles and knocking more down and knocking more down. But as leaders, my advice to us is let's overcome those obstacles and those challenges. At the same time, let us represent the kingdom very well. Pastor, this is my time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Somebody give God a hand of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Chia, God bless you. Indeed, you qualify to be a deacon. Uh, they were, uh, you see, um, when we started this ministry six years ago, there are many things we were lacking. I told somebody in a conversation the other day, and I will never be ashamed to admit that I was inexperienced as a pastor. I was a novice, but I had something. <laughs> I had a zeal. I had faith. I believe that what was in my heart was genuine and sincere. How to go about it was strictly faith. In this 
season of grace, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And sometimes faith can be very elusive. You think you got it, you got it right this time? Next thing you look, well, maybe I know I got it right this time. But I think I can do better. Amen? But we touch on some very salient points. And I want, if you can pick up your notes and rehearse with me a little bit. Somebody give you a microphone over there. Amen? So you, you said the number, you stay talking in Jesus' name. A- amen? Um, I want to start from point number one because all these notes I'm taking from you people, they're going to benefit me. Number one, uh, if I cannot sit to learn from you people, I can't lead you. Amen? If I ever come to a place and say, Pastor Philip preaching, I can't take notes. It means that I have grown in my pride. Amen? So whoever's staying up here, uh, those of us that are coming, bring your little notepads. Bring your pencils. Bring your pen. Amen? If you want to grow, Bible says faith coming by hearing. And hearing, Romans 10, 19, 17. Faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the word. Amen? It is important. So, um, you say, um, in order to be a leader, there must first be a calling, right? Ba- yes. By God? Yes, right. Um, you say, if God calls you, he will uh, change tradition. Was that one of your points? Change tra- tradition into your favor. He, t- he, t- he turned traditions? Yep. Okay. Because the tradition was the first, guess okay. it first. But the tradition was changed, and the first became the last. Into your favor? Yep. Yeah, yeah I was trying to catch up with you. Yep, sorry. Okay, and what was the second one? The second one, he will punish those that stand in your way. Okay, okay, and I said, uh, I said, well, he will remove your enemies, which, which is the same thing. Yep. Okay, and what's the other one? He will give you strength to defeat to the defeat giants. your giants. I got that right. Okay, well, what's the other one? He will give you grace to cut the line. Grace from number eight to number one. G- grace to cut the line. Yep. <laughs> Last to be first. <laughs> the last so he grace me. Uh huh. The last one, what? He will protect you. He will protect you. Indeed, God. Okay. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I like to capture everything because uh, we preach it, we learn, we can, we, we can, we can hustle. Amen. Now, uh, those of you that are here again, I want you to be thinking. My wife suggested something today. Uh, um, we'll be discussing when we go off camera. Amen. Uh, whether we can make it two per Wednesday to have two people come. That way, 